Welcome, welcome everybody. I am so glad to see all of you here tonight. I know it's a busy time of the semester, so I really want to reach out and say thank you, thank you for all of you coming. And this is a very exciting moment for, for, for us in uh, English and American Indian Studies. So um, I'm, I am delighted to introduce you to my um, Choctaw Chickasaw friend, Phil Morgan. Um, we at UGA were able to snag him while he's on his latest book tour promoting the Lost River, and which is up here and for sale. Um, the Lost River was published by, is published by the Chickasaw Nation Press in 2022. Um, Phil Morgan is a prolific, prolific writer. He's the author of The Fork in the Road Indian Poetry Store, which won the Native Writers Circle of the Americas first book award in poetry for 2002, followed followed by the Chickasaw Renaissance in 2010, Dynamic Chickasaw Women 2011, and Riding Out the Storm, 19th Century Chickasaw Governors and Their Intellectual Legacy in 2013. His groundbreaking novel, Anumpalichi, The Word Master, was published by White Dog Press in 2014, and now its companion, The Lost River, in 2022. You can see why I said prolific. Um, Morgan's books are filled with original research about the ancient Southeast, right here where we live, and on further south into Georgia. This area was uh, an amazing landscape of native tribes. Um, and part of Phil's book talks about the pandemic that really was responsible for wiping out a lot of the communities here in the ancient southeast. They are stories within stories within stories and brilliantly narrated fiction grounded in historical fact and told by using Muscogean, the language of Choctaws and Chickasaws. So please, please join me in giving a warm UGA welcome to Phil Morgan this evening as he reads from uh, The Lost River. Thank you, Leanne. It's a supreme privilege to be here. I thank you, Leanne and Jim, for not only my, some of my most respected intellectual peers, but also good friends from back in the Oklahoma Territory. The inspiration to write novels set in the pre-contact era struck me for the first time when I stood upon fabulous earthwork, the largest earthwork in North America, the Cahokia Mounds. That's across the river from St. Louis. <clears throat> I stood upon that great giant platform mound and as I looked out one spring morning with the snow dribbling down around us and I realized I was seeing evidence of a marvelous, highly developed civilization that textbooks tell me flourished from roughly 700 A.D. to 1400 A.D. and then vanished. I am now 22 years into the research and study and am convinced that the Native American civilization of that time 14th century was wiped out by the Black Death Plague, which wiped out half the population of Europe at the time. It is the predominant reason we call that period the Middle Ages, because we don't know much about it. The Black Death killed half the people in Europe, Asia, and North Africa, according to European history books, 
and I'm convinced that it also took a horrific death toll in the Americas, perhaps more than half. I believe one of the first things lost in devastating pandemics is history. People scatter, leave the cities. We've just experienced a pandemic that's killed a million people in our country. So we can relate to this. I, ha I happened to finish the novel before. I finished this novel in November 2019 about three months before our present very real pandemic was recognized and, and responded to. I was first inspired to write stories about life in North America before Columbus in the year 2000. <clears throat> I had enrolled in a master's degree program at the University of Oklahoma in the year 1999. My goal was simply to learn the Choctaw language since it was being taught at that time. I had tried to, to write fiction as a young college graduate, but I found each experience in writing fiction, fiction very frustrating. I didn't realize it at the time, but I simply needed more education. My best experience in learning to write and publish writing came when I hired on as a young man as the editor of the Bonners Ferry Herald newspaper, a weekly, a weekly rag published in Boundary County, Idaho, in, in the far north. Seeing my writing in print every week, however, and editing the entire county seat newspaper really added great and valuable experience as a writer. Still though, my main venue of creative writing at that time was poetry. I also wrote and performed original songs, but longer works came only after I entered the master's degree program at the University of Oklahoma when I was 51 years old. <clears throat> there were more than 200 languages being spoken in North America in the prehistorical age. Prehistory in the United States, of course, is just before 1500. There were more than 200 languages being spoken in North America at that time. The more I imagined life in pre-contact America, the more I felt that trusted translators were a necessity for major trade negotiations, peace treaties, and other important negotiations between nations who spoke different languages. I've called these translators word masters in my novel. Word masters, as I have imagined them, devoted themselves to being trusted translators and so were very conservative and dedicated, even to the point of remaining unmarried and without children. My main characters in these stories is the elder, elderly wordmaster Eskifa Ahalopa and his wife, Nani Tana. I tell the story in English, but the wordmaster has the opportunity to learn English from a Scottish sailboat, sailboat captain named Robert Williams who shipwrecks on the Georgia coastline near the mouth of the Altamaha River. I'm going to read first a few, <clears throat> a few paragraphs from the original, the first novel, Anonpalichi, the Wordmaster, and then follow that with some excerpts from The Lost River. I should say also that the Lost River is a real river, and we call it the Perdido River today. Some of you have probably been there. It's, it's the, the borderline between the state of Florida and the state of Alabama, and it sort of emanates in the wilderness, hence, hence the name the Lost River, or the 
Perdido River in Spanish. <clears throat> and in Opalici, the word master, the first chapter is called The Dream. And I'll read some of it to give you a sense of, of how I deal with the language and the story material. It was really challenging to have native characters teaching an English character their language and likewise to have the Englishman teaching the native characters his. The first chapter in Anongalichi, the word master, is entitled The Dream. The Malishto, the dangerous wind, had passed during the night and Eskifa Ahalopa played some of the sweetest notes ever piped from his traveling flute while he ambled along the rocky path in view of the cool blue Okata Chito, the Eastern Ocean. The orderliness of his brightly colored costume contrasted with the panorama of storm-ravaged coastal vegetation and leaf-littered beaches. He had seen 65 winters, but Eskifa felt the vigor of a much younger man. He had seen tropical gales and hurricanes before, and once again he felt an uncanny sense of joy at such powerful displays by Abba Benili, the creator of all. He marveled that his dream had drawn him toward the storm and again to this coastline after many seasons of absence from it. He felt full of anticipation for his next discovery. A whelm of scent from a Loak Pekanli, a fire flower, stopped him as he stood to take in its fragrance. He spied at that moment a coastal black cat bird clinging upside down with tiny feet to a branch of the Loak bush, not two feet in front of his nose. Loak petals lay scattered about. The diminutive bird inspected its one remaining flower. The skiffa slowly, evenly let his hand holding the flute return to his side. He gazed quietly at the bird until it seemed to have enough of him and took flight. He chuckled like a child. He loved watching birds. He had looked forward to seeing the coastal black cap ever since a wordmaster, one like himself, described it to him in Chinoli, his hometown, many winters ago. The curious bird was smaller and more delicate than its cousin who lived farther west. The skiffer could not venture to the coastline often, even though he loved the ocean. Coastal people could be so uncouth. He dismissed their worthiness while inland, saying they were so numerous it was hard to walk a hundred flight, a flight being the length of an arrow shot, without running into one of their towns. Naniapa, fish eaters, he would call them, and he would laugh uproariously. That often did not seem funny to others, he noticed. Apparently, such name-calling was judged inappropriate for an Anopolici, the wordmaster. That made it all the more appealing to him. After all, he was not an Anopolici, he was a Yukpin Anopolici a Yukpin wordmaster. Most of the 19 languages he spoke had separate words for to bless and to laugh. Only Eskifa's people used one word, Yukpa, for both, to bless and to laugh, thus equating them. They called themselves Yukpins, so they were known everywhere in Yakni Moma, the world, either as the blessed or laughing people. The skiff I identified personally as Chikasha, born in a Chikasha town to a Chikasha mother, but his father was Chata, so he felt affection for both tribes, which in the past had been one. Both were members of the Yukpin Confederacy for many generations, and because his relations scattered throughout the land, the skiff felt loyalty and a great sense of security in the Confederacy. It included tribes from the south coast all the way to the Tennessee and Ohio rivers, 
wordmasters like him were indispensable for keeping the Confederacy together and responsible for communications between the tribes. The salt spray breeze brushed the skiffo while he stood on the seaside trail, once again drawing intoxicating vapors of blowout blossoms to his nostrils. He stepped forward, cupping the lovely crimson flower in his left hand and pulled it close to his nose. The scent reminded him of the Okla, the town where he stayed the night before. He felt more than reluctant to make himself known in any coastal town, but the afternoon gust front of the storm coming in from the sea told him it would be a bruiser when it made landfall. He reasoned the repugnance of vulgar people would be less uncomfortable than a howling summer fury. Transplanted lilac bushes stood in gardens in the town, and their cut blossoms adorned shell vessels in this humble home of the local wordmaster, Cajito, and his wife. Her name was Nuptala, where and with them, Eskifa begrudgingly sought shelter. It was bad enough to be quarantined all night with fish eaters, but to make matters worse, the couple's widowed daughter, Hoseini, also lived there. She possessed an uncommon beauty and a needfulness Eskifa found tempting. She performed a dance after their meal, a tasteful one that became more suggestive only when she faced him. If she had come to him, if she had come to his bed during the night, he felt sure he would probably not been able to, have re to resist her. Although Yakpins were sometimes polygamous, wordmasters agreed to only one wife at a time so as not to distract from their duties and studies. Wordmasters typically did little farming and had small immediate families, so they had little need or means of support for more than one wife. The skiffa delighted in getting back to his journey. He found Cajito tiresome and had to speak his tongue because the fish eater only knew snippets of other languages. The wordmaster traditions had grown weak among the coastal peoples. They mostly lived in small disconnected towns, intermarrying up and down the seemingly endless shores so often the customs and language of one tribe seemed barely distinguishable from the rest. Even while they spoke somewhat exotic languages, the skiffer noticed elements of at least two foreign tongues mixed with Kehito's native Onaha. Kehito did not seem aware of that. The boat people traded up and down the coast, brought a mixture of influences to Onaha culture, Eskifa and Kihito discussed language as wordmasters, but Kihito's knowledge was quickly exhausted, and their talk degenerated into the same argument Eskifa heard all along his journey. How many of your people are going to the Yamoni? Eskifa, Kihito asked, cheerfully sounding eager to change the subject from language. The question touched a more a nerve inside a skiffa. Yumomi, the, the fashionable event, was the traditional intertribal stickball contest held every 10 summers, pitting the best players from the Yutman Confederacy against players from the tribes of the Alahashi domain, whose capital, Tochina, which was Cahokia, and hosted by the Alahashi ruler Yeshoba, whom Eskifa did not trust in the least. Ishko, none, Eskifa replied stoically. None? None. Don't you know it's going to be the best stickball competition ever held? Kehito asked, astonished. I know it's going to be the biggest mistake ever made, the skiffer rebutted. How can it be a mistake? Don't you yuckmans like stickball, Kehito asked, snidely. Everyone knows that we love Tolly stickball, 
What we do not love are the Alahashi and Yeshoba, the skiffer explains, knowing Kahito already understood his position. Well, this is our chance to show him for a fool on the field of honor, is it not? Kahito appealed, nevertheless. It is a chance to be shown as fools ourselves, the, skif the skiffer retorted. The Alahashi are rich in trade goods, Kahito persisted. Their cities are large, and they produce a large surplus of food, I'm told. What they make is artistic and very high in quality. Most are saying that only a few old fools are against trade with the Alahashi, and even fewer are against this great competition. That's what they said about the great teacher Anoli and previously Como, the prophet, the Skiffa said. And did they turn out to be old fools? But things were different then, Kahito argued. Those old hatreds died with our foremothers. I'm not so sure, a skiff of caution. The Alahashi always worshipped strange gods. They required blood sacrifice. And they think the sun of the sun is equal with Abba Benili. They surely must have come from the great mountain range far to the south and west, very strange and foreign in their ways. Kehito reacted indignantly. I do not believe it. Human sacrifice has been against our laws for many generations, even in that part of Yatni Moma. Their people would not tolerate such abomination. That's what their name means, you know, children of the sun, as Skiffa said. They've drawn several new and large tribes into their confederacy and have become more decadent than ever. I've also heard from reliable people, traveling builders, that Yeshoba has reinstituted human sacrifice into their temple worship. Kahito stared at him, stunned. But of course, I hope you are right, Honorable Wordmaster. I hope you are right, the skiff added, wishing not to upset his host. All I counsel is to ask yourselves if the gains are worth the risks. Where is my bed, kind master, he asked politely. I have walked 300 flight today and I am spent. So as the story rolls out, <clears throat> they go to the, to the Yumomi, the great 10-year stickball contest in the great city of Cahokia slash St. Louis and, and the Alahashi spring a trap and the rest of the story rolls out from there. But interestingly at the <clears throat> at the end of the uh, of the treacherous betrayal in in Cahokia, the the Alahashi sacrifice the goat that managed to survive the, the shipwreck with Robert Williams, the Welsh sailor, and when the leaders ate the goat, they caught the plague. And the plague then spread through the city and the city was abandoned. And the story rolls out from there. In the sequel, The Lost River, which was really hard for me to write because I, it was hard for me to write my characters through a pandemic. It was terrifying. I had come to identify with them and it was really challenging. But finally, I just, after months of meditation, I, I decided to experiment. In, in a form of writing, and I just didn't conceive of the plot beforehand. I just sat down and started typing, okay? And I picked up where the first story left off with people fleeing the plague in the big city of Cahokia, and it was very painful. And every day, I never, I never wrote an outline. I felt more like a medium. I would sit down and write each day, not knowing where the story would go. So, as it turned out, uh, having now experienced the pandemic myself, 
I, I did a pretty good job in drafting my characters' experience. They had to flee their northern community, which was near the, the, the worst, the outbreak of the plague, and they kept fleeing south until they got to the Gulf Coast, too, and they found a home in an abandoned city, which on the Perdido River, we call it today, the Lost River, on the coast about 25 miles east of Mobile Bay. Okay, I'm reading my note here. Tell about the Salt Lake City airport encounter revealing a canal across the peninsula. So I have my characters, you know, I'm writing this just like a medium, I feel like. My characters are approaching Mobile Bay, and I don't even know where they're going to stop. I've never even heard of a city around Mobile Bay in prehistoric times until I uh, got far enough in my research to discover what they call Bottle Creek Mounds nowadays, is that correct, Jim? Yes. And it's a city north of the Mobile Bay up in those uh, amazing Delta River uh, complexes that's impossible to reach by land even today. So a hidden, a hidden city, but it was the largest city on the Gulf Coast at that time, and I call it in Oatapa. So here's a little excerpt. Oh, I, but I have to say that, so I don't know, I finally decide, I, I discover the city, Noah Tapa, but I don't know what's going to happen next. I'm on an airplane flying to Salt Lake City, and when I get off the plane, I'm standing there talking to the person who sat next to me in the plane, waiting on my baggage, and I, I hear this voice, Dr. Morgan? I turn around and it's it's obviously an American Indian woman that I've never met before. <clears throat> she she I in, introduced herself and said that she worked for Kirk Perry, an old friend of mine, and and that they were studying the archaeology of that region. And she told me that one of her archaeology friends had just discovered evidence of a canal from Mobile Bay. Perdido Bay, so my characters knew what they were going to do next. <laughs> so in chapter 14 of, of The Lost River, we, we are introduced to the uh, Noah Toppin Cross Peninsular Canal. Ahitaka, the young warrior whom Hachiopani had mentioned, was waiting for a skiff at the bottom of the great stairway of the Minkos, the Minkos, the chief, Palace Mound. My name is Ahitaka, honorable word master, the young man said, politely greeting Eskifa. I am assigned to take you to the camp of your people. Eskifa nodded his head politely, and I am Eskifa, myself honored to meet you, young man. I must say, politely that we should make our way upstream as soon as possible. Ahitaka continued before we lose our daylight. So by this time, my characters from, from the town in the northwestern Chickasaw Nation, about 300 people, have, have fled south to the, to the Gulf of Mobile. Uh, Mobile was called in that day. And they're, wait, they're trying to find a place to, to light. I must say politely that we should make our way upstream as soon as possible. So Eskifa has been to the town and talked to the chief and been offered a place for his people to winter on Perdido Bay, the Lost River Bay. Eskifa was relieved not only simply to be alive, but to be bearing good news for his friends. I am ready, my friend, Eskifa responded. When you are ready, Ahitaka showed Eskifa the fresh water supply in the private area on their way to his small, well-crafted canoe. Another young warrior, who nodded politely, 
port a skiff and was already aboard to help Ahitaka row the vessel. The skiff made a sitting place close enough to converse with Ahitaka as he rowed. There are several things I need to ask you, young man, Skiffa explained as he sat down and they set off upriver. The Skiffa glided his hand along the smooth edge of the well-crafted canoe, appreciating its craftsmanship. The Skiffa was most curious about their time-saving canal across the peninsula, which took the place of riskier rowing upon the open sea. How long have you and Noah Toppins been using the canal across the peninsula to Lost River Bay, as Skiffa asked, his young guide. Your Minko briefly described it for me. For as long as anyone can remember, my great-grandmother speaks of using it, Ahitaka replied while he rode strongly but quietly. In early times, long walks were required to pick up different elements of the canal passage. It has been during the reign of Hachiopani that our people have perfected the canals, which connect the natural rivers and streams between the Bay of Mabila and the Bay of the Lost River and the Bay of Pensacola. The Skiffa admired how articulate his young guide was and enjoyed brushing up on his understanding of the local dialects, which seemed mostly personal and historical with the Skiffa himself. What my Minko recommended as a starting settlement for our Chikasha brothers and sisters is for us to explore the Lost River and the Lost River Bay and its beautiful, beautiful barrier island. The whole region is lush with plentiful freshwater springs and lots of food, the young man narrated as he stopped rowing for a moment to rest. His partner, Behind him joined the brief pause in rowing. Ahitaka reached for his water jug, and a skiffa drank from his own as well. Ahitaka resumed rowing, but continued to explain. The bay was hit hard five years ago by a big violent storm we call Huracan, with vicious winds and high surges of seawater that killed many people and destroyed whole towns. The people decided to build back their homes and towns in more protected forests inland and quite a distance east. He paused as if remembering or reviewing what he had said. We rarely suffer the Huracan, and Hachiopani believes, as do I, that you, Chikasha, can make a fine and healthy home there until it's safe for you to move back north. Your descriptions sound positive and inviting, my young friend, the Skiffa said genuinely. Thank you for your generous and enthusiastic offer. But I must ask, what happens if we don't like the Lost River and Bay with its barrier island? Then your people will camp, and you and I and other elders will continue by canal and creek to Pensacola Bay, an only another day toward the morning sun and you can measure your chances there. Why are you so hopeful about Lost River Bay for us, my honest young man, the Skiffa asked. Because you are a people of action, and in Lost Bay there will be likely no one to answer to beyond your own counsel. With no interference, the autumn will be sufficient for you to establish a good winter camp. The Skiffa thanked his Anoatapan escorts when they landed where the rest of the community was camping upriver. He immediately noticed that his Chikasha brothers and sisters seemed comfortably situated in their camp on well-tended, slightly higher ground than the calm river. I will leave you now, Skiffa said to his boatman with a smile. I have much to talk over with the elders. Imoma appeared almost as soon as they had landed, and a Skiffa asked Imoma, to show the young warriors where they may camp. The skiffa quickly found and hugged Nanitana. She seemed greatly happy and relieved to see him, but people quickly clustered around them to hear a skiffa's report. You will be glad to hear that people here are friendly and generous, the skiffa began. The Minko of Anoatapa is called Hachiokpani. He and his wife, Anachaha, have offered us sanctuary in an abandoned town less than two days south from here on the coast. 
An impolitely loud reaction rippled through the Chikasha's gathered round. I know this is not ideal, but it sounds like it might work, Skiffa said, raising his hands, speaking loudly enough that the talkers quieted down. It's not a perfect solution, but I think we can make it work. There were great hums of conversation all around the Chikasha camp that night, and much anticipation the next day. Okay, I'm going to skip to another section a little bit later in the story. thick scent of decay filled the air, like death, he thought, and felt fear tingle down his spine. The smell had been the first thing he noticed, but other senses started trickling in. He heard people, people in pain, muffled coughs, groans, sobbing. He felt he couldn't escape, like walls slowly closing around him only a matter of time until they could press the breath out of him. Captivity. Were the people in pain trapped? A skiff had tried to look around to gather more information so he might help the people, but his vision was obstructed, almost as though an imaginary cloth had been placed over his eyes. He reached toward, toward the void, feeling for a moment what he thought might be wood, but everything rocked back and forth, further disorienting him. This was wrong. He shouldn't be here. But as he searched for a way out, he felt a hand grip his arm, dragging him down into a sea of nothingness. The skiffo woke and sat straight up in his bed. Despite the moderate temperature, he was drenched in sweat. Just a dream, just a dream, he chanted to himself. He inspected where his arm had been grabbed in the dream, but there were no marks. It had felt so real. He looked down at Nanitana, still sound asleep at his side. What does this mean? He said a silent prayer to the Creator for guidance and fervently hoped this wasn't a dream he saw come true. Can they really go to war about religion? Askifa asked the elders later on that day in council on Lost River Bay. They had gathered at the wordmaster's house on the Shell Mound near the harbor to discuss news that had traveled up the coastline to Mabilla. The Mexica, known to be friends with the enemy Alahashi, raided towns far to the west and were coming threateningly close to Yuckman Confederacy territory. We are fortunate, Skiffa continued, to live as far away as we do from, from central Mexico. But reputable sources say they have really built up that high ground city of theirs, and now they rule the tribes from their high lake all the way up to their east coast. Messengers from our far western allies say the Mexica have their coastal towns all worked up with their sun worship talk, coyote talk aimed at stealing what we have. It's the same talk the Alahashi fed their citizens in Tochina. We need to be ready for them in the spring, my brothers and sisters, in the spring. But this is our own town. This is not our own town, our country. Napakali, a normally quiet elder, responded, You talk, Eskifa, like we should be preparing for war against people many of us have never even heard of until this winter. You are being naive, Napakali. What are you going to say to the warriors coming into our bay, followed by 20 other canoes full of angry Mexico? Hello? Give us some time. We just want to go home? The skiffa noticed Napakali looked offended. I am not your enemy, my brother Napakali. I'm your friend. 
the Chata are your friends, the Mabella, the Pascagoula, and the Biloxi are your friends. They all live between us and the Mexica, but what if the Mexica had big boats like our pale-skinned friends? They might attack us first. They might attack a number of towns in the same, at the same time and break up our warning signals like the drums. Feelings flared, a skiff a pause so they could cool and let everyone contemplate their perilous future. He looked out the window of the old council house. It still showed signs of storm damage. The sun had fallen beneath the thick treetops, mostly palms, and shed beautiful orange light onto their reconstructed little bayside town. A nice breeze fluttered the fronds if a wind with some bite. It was late in the month of extended hunger, warmer than Chinoli, but still bearing the tooth or two. A skiffa spoke again. I am always the first to worry, it seems, but I do not talk from fear. I speak from dreams of knowledge. I do not poke fear. I prod preparedness. We Chikasha are known for little else. Think about these things soberly. Be prepared, my brothers and sisters. Okay. <clears throat>